Welcome to another edition of the Resilient Living Podcast, a show dedicated to improving quality of life for both people and planet through liberation and independence, moving from surviving to thriving and living life on your own terms. All right, guys, this show is about sustainability, resilient living, about living that liberating life. And I can't think of anything better than to learn how to grow your own food. And I think a lot of people are deterred from doing that. And they're just kind of broken down thinking that they can't, that they have a brown thumb, a black thumb, all that kind of stuff. You know, and guys, it's really not that hard. I'm going to show you guys just some really easy steps, some stuff to do if you're just starting out and why everything fails, why a lot of things will go wrong because we got it backwards. You see, we're trying to grow plants, but what we really need to do is grow soil first. And that's the, that is the key. And that's what brings me into my first uh, notes here is to get started with container gardening and why. Okay, so a lot of you guys had your land scraped. You know, you don't know what happened over there. There could be these parcels that were built and they brought a bulldozer in. And if you understand anything about soil, is the first top few inch sometimes, if that, half inch in some places, there's barely any organic matter. So what happens is a lot of that soil has been sitting dormant, you know, without no sunshine, without no nutrients or nothing, uh, give or take, depending on which uh, philosophy and, and uh, mindset you have on that as far as nutrients. But the top area of the live stuff has been scraped off. And now you're just left with this dead zone that has to rebuild itself. So you go to plant in there, of course things aren't going to go right. You don't know if somebody's been dumping used motor oil or, I mean, there's things happening all, that, that have happened in the, in the past all over the place. The things that you, you can never know. And that could be contributing to a lot of things is what's happening, why your plants aren't growing. So this is the reason why I think anybody who's starting to garden, we should actually start fresh. And it's a simple uh, mixture of vermiculite or perlite or peat moss with uh, a compost, any kind of compost, worm casting, stuff like that. You can check out my biodegradable container gardening uh, uh, business that I've got going on my show biodegradable container gardening and we have videos showing you how to actually mix that soil so it's equal parts one one third of, uh, of vermiculite or perlite one third of peat moss and one third of any kind of compost you can find try to mix up as many different composts if you're using uh, worm castings you can just use uh, one whole third part of, uh, of worm castings and what's this going to do is this is going to uh, give you a good soil with no pathogens no toxins no nothing it gets you started off right off now, the minimal amount of uh, soil that you want to grow stuff in at the root systems is going to be five gallons uh, for most stuff. You can do little things like lettuces and things like that. But just as if you're starting out and you do this mixture, I'm telling you, you'll have the soil for probably about 10, 15 years. You can keep repurposing it. So it's not like you have to throw it out like the regular potting mix that you're going to find uh, in, in uh, like, say, your, your home depots or your, you know, your hardware stores. But... This is going to get you guys started off where things are going to grow really good. Uh, it gives you about, I'd say, a 75% chance that something's going to survive. Now, we have other things such as uh, uh, you know, bugs, diseases, and things like that. But just to get yourself started off, at least we eliminated one of the biggest problems that, that there is in gardening, in my opinion, and that is the soil. So invest in some soil. And you, you can keep this stuff. You can let it dry up. You can bag it up, box it up, uh, put it in a, in a bucket and uh, put a lid on it, keep it somewhere if, you know, for a year. If you don't want to garden anymore, say you want to skip something, you can, it's always there for you. Just re-moisten it, add some compost, and you're up and running again. So there's so much to show you guys. I, I really like you guys to comment, especially on, on a show like this one. Let me know what you guys exactly want to hear. I'm just trying to engineer stuff here uh, to think about what people want to know, uh, what would help them. But yeah, there's, a, there's an email below. You guys can get a hold of me. Email me and let me know what your question is. And please, part, please part in the background noise. That's my vehicle. I'm on my work commute. Okay, so yeah, the best thing is, is a five-gallon uh, container. You can use clay. The cheapest thing that you guys can do and easiest is a, is a five-gallon bucket. Just go and take a drill and drill yourself a few holes in the bottom. If you're, just, if you're scared of a drill, you're just starting out, go get yourself a, a regular old five-gallon uh, planter from the hardware store if you've got the money, right? And just fill that thing up. And put your seeds in there, put your seedlings and start growing. Stuff will start popping. Throw a bunch of seeds inside there. You know, if you're growing a tomato bush, put like five seeds. Poke your finger in about a half an inch down into that soil. Drop yourself in two seeds per hole and do about five of those little little pits. And if, uh, if all of them take off, just snip off a couple right down to the ground. They will, uh, uh, or you can pull them out 
and they will die and you'll have the one that wants to survive, that one will grow. So, uh, and, guard, and container gardens is just so much too, guys. If there's an area of your house that doesn't get sun, you can move it, you can pick it up and move it wherever you want. So it's not like you have to go and dig in the ground. That's the other thing I look at too, is that in-ground gardening, you'd have to go and till the soil up, get yourself a shovel, and a lot of you guys probably don't have time and a lot of you guys want to start growing your own food, but it's like, wow, I don't want to go through all the work and everything. You know, I've got other things to do. I just, you know, I don't want to bombard myself. Well, the container gardening, it's, what, what are you going to do? You're going to unzip a bag. You're going to mix a couple components, pour it inside a five-gallon bucket, water it all down, throw a seed and forget about it. Uh, almost. You're going to have to need to keep up water. So speaking of ground, if you are going to grow in the ground and you're poor and you're like, hey, man, I really want to get into this stuff and... I want to start growing my own food. Where's the first thing that I start? And if you ask any professional, in my opinion, they're going to say the same. They're going to say, get a soil test. This is the most important thing. You need to understand what's going on in that soil. Uh, there's a difference between dirt and soil. There's dirt just doesn't have anything in it. There's soil, which has live microbiology and, and all kinds of living organisms and things inside of it. And those are the things that your plants are going to need. But we got to find out what that organic matter is what the pH is, right? For those of you who don't know, the pH of your body, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is on a spectrum of alkaline and acidity. The optimum pH to grab a bunch of nutrients for your plants to, <coughs> to live optimally, and, and interestingly enough, human beings as well, as, wa as well as the water we drink, the pH of our body is uh, 6.5 to 7.2, give or take there. That means that a lot of nutrients and, and minerals and vitamins in your soil is locked up if you're at 7.8, right? And if you're at 4.2, you know, you got a lot of stuff that's not going to do very well. So you need to understand the difference between acidic and alkaline. And uh, everything in this world is biological like that, even your soil. So you would need to know that if you've got a very acidic soil, you're going to have to do some amendments first. And that's what I recommend is throwing some amendments. Do a soil test. And guys... Uh, I use Logan Labs. I'm not, I have no sponsors or nothing at all. Actually, I paid to be here, so don't worry about that. Uh, but yeah, I use Logan Labs. It's like $35. You can put a little cup of soil inside of a bag. You can mail it off, and they'll tell you exactly what's going on, how much uh, lime or you need or anything that you need to amend this with, how many pounds. For an extra, I think, $15, you could actually get on a phone and talk to a, a professional who will walk you step by step through the mathematics and everything else. Do yourself this favor. Maybe some of you are like, I don't want to spend $35. Think about it, guys. $35. Now there's no guessing game. You guys are going to go plant stuff and hope, cross your fingers, and you're going to wait for about a month, you know, two months, three months, or a whole year, and wonder why things aren't growing when it could have been a $35 uh, repair job that you could have done, where somebody could have said, hey, this is what you got to do. Do this, this, and that, and then you'll, you'll grow no problem. So really consider doing a soil test and consider uh, uh, understanding what you're gonna need to do for amendments if you really are serious about growing some of your own food. All right, so five simple starter plants, and these are the most popular. And this is why I say grow these things because they're relatively easy. Some are quicker growing than others. My first one's a tomato, and I got cucumber, peppers, lettuce, and zucchini. Now tomatoes are probably one of the most simplest things to grow. Uh, in a five-gallon bucket container, you're, you're not going to get as much harvest as you would if you were in, say, a 20-gallon container. They're heavy feeders. You guys got to understand that, too. When you're growing stuff, they're going to deplete the soils. So whether you're in in-ground or you're growing in a container, they're going to eat up all the vitamins and nutrients around them. Uh, cucumbers, uh, zucchini, uh, your peppers, lettuce are pretty much light feeders, and those are things you can get away with, like, a one-gallon pot. So literally just fill up the pot. Uh, maybe pat it down a little bit on top, sprinkle, uh, say about a, I don't know, grab some seeds in your fingers, guess at about maybe 20 seeds, and just lightly sprinkle them over the top. Get yourself some raw vermiculite and sprinkle that over the seeds very lightly, just enough to cover them. Spritz it with some water and just leave it alone there. Uh, well, you'll have to keep spritzing it with water. We're going to get into irrigation uh, here in a minute. And you'll have a whole entire bushel of lettuce growing, of baby greens. And even if you uh, just grow them and throw them away, you now have the experience. It's the same thing with, uh, you know, you guys don't have to propagate your plants uh, separately. You don't have to go and, 
you know, get the seed trays and go through all that stuff if you're busy. Just drop some seeds inside these pots as long as you miss them every day or set them on some automated irrigation. You'll have plants for sure. You'll have stuff growing. Now, a reason why I pick a lot of these things are these are things that you'll actually eat. And I think that you guys should choose one species at a time if you're bombarded and you're just kind of confused and you're kind of uh, scared to really jump in. Just do something like tomatoes. Master one and then move on to the next one. But what I do recommend if you guys are growing uh, uh, aggressively, if you want to get into this, um, and not even not aggressive, I guess I'll take that back. If you're just wanting to grow and you want to actually see something happen, you want to get some fruits, <clears throat> now understand like some tomatoes you can grow, they're just not going to do well in your, your, uh, your biome, in your area. Maybe you get some frost or very cold weather or something like that. And it's going to drop, get blossom uh, drops and stuff like that, blossom end rot, uh, which can happen from soil and various other type of things and genetics. So what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to plant many different varieties. So I would really actually recommend like someone start out with tomatoes and just go out and get yourself as many species, as many different varieties as possible. I mean, even if it's two or three or four, I would like to see you guys do like five. You know, get yourself five, or I'm sorry, like probably about 10. I'd say get yourself like 10 five gallon buckets, fill them all up full of soil. If you're doing it in ground, devote an area to just tomatoes and plant 10 different varieties. And the reason for this is that you're actually selecting for what's going to grow in your area. Now, it's not just your soil. It could be the temperature. It could be diseases and things like that. The fluctuation in temperature. It could be the insects. There's all kinds of things that could happen. You guys can get powdery mildew and not even know about it. So that's why when you plant stuff and you plant many varieties, you're most likely going to get some fruit off the harvest. But what's going to be really nice is it's going to show you what kind of bugs are showing up. And you guys want to take note. Now, this is not just something where you just set it, forget it, and walk away, right? You're going to need to take note. You're going to, your garden is only as good as your shadow over it. You know, you're, that's, that's where you're going to learn stuff. So you guys want to keep an eye on certain things. Like notice how a tomato hornworm is, is going to be your, your worst enemy uh, with, uh, with tomato plants. And what I want you guys to do is to notice that maybe at some point there's the tomato hornworms are attacking certain plants first and maybe others uh, uh, last, or maybe not even at all. Maybe out of those 10 species, you've got something that the tomato worms are just, believe it or not, there are people who breed stuff. We actually have a show with Joseph Lofthouse called Land Race Gardening. And that means growing stuff specifically for that, many different varieties, cross-pollinating them. You know, that gets a little intricate, but I just want you guys to know you don't have to do all that unless you want to. But plant as many different varieties of, of each species as you can and that will tell you what's going to grow in your area most optimally. I think that's the problem is people get one species and they'll get it from, say, New York, right? We live in California. Of course, those, those see, the plants aren't going to do well. They've been adapted to, to New York weather. Uh, you bring them to California and they're just going to, they're used to the cold. They're not going to deal very well with the heat and vice versa. So you need to find stuff that's localized. And you know what you guys could do is go to your farmer's market. Uh, Joseph Lofthouse was talking about this. Go buy yourself a bunch of different varieties of heirloom tomatoes or whatever organic tomatoes you want. Take the seeds out, dry them all up, learn how to, you know, you, you ferment it, you put them in a jar, you, you fill it with water, you let it ferment for a couple days until it gets really, uh, it has to get rid of that sack that's around the, the seeds. You'll notice it's like this little jelly sack. That's an anti-growth inhibitor, uh, which is interesting when you eat that stuff. I wonder what that does to your belly. But it, that stuff needs to rot off, and then you rinse your seeds out, put them on a paper towel or on a piece of cardboard, dry them out, and there you, wham, bam, you got seeds, and you got localized seeds. This is stuff that people are already growing. So, Jack, yeah, very much consider choosing many different varieties. All right, and also when you're growing, I think that you're going to want to take in consideration what we call in the permaculture realm, zone one. You have uh, zone zero, that's your home, right? You can imagine you have your home, that's zone zero. As you step out of your backyard or over to your mailbox, that's zone one. Places that you most frequent, right? It's like this ring, this area. If you had it all fenced off, if, if you put black ink all over your shoes and we took you to a basketball court and we let you live in a, in a, in a little tent or something and we wanted to find out what your, where, where you went, what, what, what was the zones you went to, right? You'd have a black mark and we would trace out an area and go, this is where they most frequent. There'd be an outdoor kitchen, a bathroom, and things like that. That's zone one. So in your backyard, you want to consider zone one. Where's 
an area that like when you're walking to your mailbox where you're going to pass by every single day, that's where you're going to put your pots so that you can look down and kind of check on things. You go and put this way up against the fence somewhere in the backyard, uh, you know, most likely you're not going to be checking on things as much as you would if it was right outside your front door or in your patio where you lounge, you know, things like that. So keep them in places where it's visible and where it's very simple and easy to get to so it's that less of a job. Um, water is, uh, watering the simple way is my next note here. Now, a lot of you guys who are busy like me, I'd like to let you guys know this. I'm not just blabbering off a bunch of words here. This is actually experience. I don't, I have an entire uh, farm where I'm growing over 300 different plants, about 350. I think it's added now, probably close to 400. And it's on property I don't own, spin farm location. And I show up once a week on Fridays. I have everything on automation. It's not that hard. Uh, one of the biggest things I think that's happened with people is uh, I would talk to them and they'd ask my help and say, I don't know why, but my plants died. We checked the soil, you know, they did good soil and all that. I think the problem was that they let it dry out. Once your roots dry out, that's it. The plant goes in shock and it most likely is going to die. If it doesn't, it's going to grow very poorly. You know, its roots just got burned. It just got dehydrated and it's not going to do too well. So to avoid something like this, we want to get ourselves some automated water drip irrigation. And what you're going to do is you guys are going to get yourself a timer. Go down to any of your local hardware stores. They'll even help you. Uh, I don't have anybody I can recommend as far as uh, which brand to use. They're all pretty much the same to me. But it's just basically a timer that takes two AA batteries. That connects to your water hose, to your spigot. And they even have stuff with a, a water, water, a drip irrigation system with a timer that you turn with a dial, right? You could hook up a water hose to it. It goes out to the garden. Uh, the drip, the little holes, the drips are over each one of your plants into your buckets or into your garden. And all you have to do really is go and turn that dial. Uh, it, you leave the, the water faucet on all the time. You just turn that dial for say like five minutes, 10 minutes. And what it does is it'll open up the, the valve and it'll water your plants for five, 10 minutes. And then after that, it'll shut it off. All you got to do is walk out every morning, twist the valve, go to work. I prefer the battery where you hook up to the spigot, the timer, and you can set uh, twice a day. You can set a minute, two minutes, three minutes, whatever you want. Uh, offset them. It's very simplified. It's not very complicated at all. And this is going to join into a uh, pressure regulator that, so it doesn't blow the, uh, uh, your hose lines out. Uh, your water pressure from your house is relatively high. Uh, you're also going to have a black flow preventer. I know all this stuff is probably sounding like a lot, but all it is is some, just look at the diagram of what you need. It's right there in the books usually, or somebody can help you there uh, uh, with the drip irrigation. There's a, fil a filter that you'll need to clean out so it doesn't plug up your, your drip uh, points. But really guys, it's like four or five components. You just screw them all together with, you don't even need pliers, all by hand. Plug it into your, uh, your spigot, turn on the water hose and never have to shut it off again. And you want to anchor in your drip irrigation lines directly into your pots or in your garden with some sort of wire clips, which they do sell as well. And this, guys, all you have to do is go check on your garden. You don't ever have to worry about watering. And this is what's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of spoil of harvest, a lot of death of your plants. So the last one I have here is just burying your stuff, burying your compost. Uh, my grandmother, I remember as a kid, would have tomato bushes, watermelon stuff growing from underneath trees. Remember how we said that uh, your, your plants are going to deplete the soil around it? They're going to eat up. Basically, it's like lunch. They're going to eat all the food. Well, what you're going to want to do is uh, instead of doing a lot of work, like my grandmother, is you're just going to take your banana peels, bread, and all your food scraps, and you're just going to dig a hole in the ground, and you're going to bury them. You can literally dig yourself like a trench, like about a six inch or you know one foot would probably be optimal. Uh, but about a, I'd say about an eight inch to six inch trench, like just about maybe a foot wide by say about four feet long. <clears throat> Throw the soil off to the side and leave this trench. Every time you get your coffee can, like my grandmother had of eggshells and food scraps, you just dump it in there and just throw a little bit of soil. That's it. Just leave it alone. She didn't water. She didn't do anything. Of course, being underneath the tree, uh, it is in my opinion that the tree gathered dew and the sunshine wasn't depleting all the, the moisture in that soil. And that's why she had stuff just sprouting up. Or stuff will stay dormant, and after a good rainstorm, it gets soaked, everything just starts to pop. So it's actually, you can devote an area of your garden where you don't even do anything. Don't even get a soil test. Don't get, don't get uh, five-gallon buckets or pots or anything like that. Don't even buy seeds. 
just go and take all your food waste and just start burying it in various areas of your backyard and watch what happens. I guarantee you the only ingredient they will need is a, is a little bit of water. They need to stay hydrated and you will have stuff popping and growing. It's that simple, guys. It's not that hard. Uh, meanwhile, if you're if stuff isn't you know go, doing too well as far as from you burying it, you're actually caught. Maybe if there's something wrong with your soil, you're actually repairing the soil. Just keep doing this over and over again. Eventually, all that food's going to break down. It's going to give nutrients. It's going to neutralize the soil, break down into compost. The worms are going to show up. All the microbiology and things are going to start to happen. And sooner or later, just by the fact of you burying all of your your food scraps, something good is going to come out of it. Besides, you're doing less waste planet and doing some good part all right guys that's the show i want to thank you guys each and every one of you for taking the time out and being here today and if you guys can give me a thumbs up a thumbs down if you did give me a thumbs down please let me know why i love to hear all your guys' opinions but it really helps me out that's all i'm asking is if you guys like and share comment on the show it helps the algorithms for this show to get known that's what's going to keep the lights on around here so guys, there's an email down below in the description. If you guys want to make any comments, just say hello, give any suggestions. And as I always say, guys, go out there and have yourself a near life experience. Don't lose your muchness. Carry on the fire and human up, my friends.